Good afternoon. Let me ask you to please turn to 2 Samuel, chapter 12. We will be considering verses 15 to 31. 2 Samuel 15, rather 12, 15 to 31. And uh, I read. 2 Samuel, chapter 12, 15 to 31. Then Nathan went to his house, and the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, he would not nor did he eat food uh, with them. On the seventh day, the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, but the child was yet alive. We spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then, how then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do himself some harm. But when David saw his servants, that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servant, Is the child dead? They said, He is. Then David arose from the ark, and washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped him, and worshipped. He then went to his own house, and when he had asked, they, uh, and when he, he asked, they set food before him. And he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? Fasted and wept for the child when he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, When the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. I, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her. And she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent a message, message by Nathan the prophet. So he called him Jedediah because of the Lord. Now Joab fought against Rab of the Ammonites and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, I have fought against Rab, and moreover, I have taken the city of waters. Now then, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called in my name, by my name. So David gathered all the people together and went to Rab and fought against it and took it. And he took the crown of the, their king from his head. The weight of it was, uh, was a talent of gold, and in it was a precious stone. And it was placed on David's head. And he brought out the spoil of the city, a very great amount. And he brought out the people who were in it, and set them to labor with souls and iron peaks, and iron axes, and made them toil at the brick kilns. And thus he did to all the cities of the Ammonite. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Before we look at God's word, let's turn to him and ask him for help. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening. We again plead and ask you that you would feed us from your word. We thank you that you uh, fed us in the morning from the book of Romans. We thank you where uh, your word was brought to us and we saw that indeed Christ has done it all and therefore we can live a life victorious of uh, the, the, the guilt of the law. And now, O oh Lord, we pray that again you would give us a hunger for your word and help us to take it in, that your word would strengthen us, 
that the weak would be strengthened, that the careless would be warned, that the unbeliever would be convicted and would turn to Christ in faith, and that your church would be built this evening. So please be with us and be with me. Help me to be faithful, to be clear, to be simple as I bring out your word. So we thank you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. An observation I made, uh, uh, I think, since I was in primary school, is that many schools have mottos. You know, they have this motto where they um, state who they are or what they desire to be. You know, you have a motto like, uh, we will excel. Or mottos like, uh, winners always. You know, interestingly enough, there is a church that even calls itself the Winner's Chapel, okay? So there is so much of winner, winner this, winner that, victorious, and even the word overcomer. We were even joking sometime, uh, I think we were, we were with some brethren and we were joking and thinking about how churches are called overcomer churches, winner's churches. But then you wonder, where is the place for the losers? Does this world have a place for those who lose? Does this world have a place for those who do not overcome? Who are actually overcome? Who are not victorious? And sad to say that the world, to be honest, doesn't have a place for losers. It doesn't have a place for those who have failed. And that's why those who fail are simply brushed under the carpet by the world. And we forget them and we move on to the next thing. But is this the attitude of the church? Should this be our attitude? Is this what we see in the Bible whenever people fail? Whenever they are overcome? Well, I would like to see us to see from this passage this afternoon that from the example of David, that God cares for the losers. God cares for the failure. God cares for those who have not been able to overcome, who have not been able to win, those who have actually fallen in such a huge and a public way like David. I mean, what greater failure would there be like David? I mean, a man who God exalted from being a shepherd to now being the king of God's people, and then he falls, as we saw in chapter 10 and 11. What hope is there? For such a man. What kind of an attitude should he have? Should we tell David, you know, David, sorry, you are great, you have fallen, bye bye, see you, God has nothing else to do with you. That's not what we see. We see that the heart of David shows, or as we shall see in this passage, that the heart of David shows that for those who have fallen, for those who have not overcome, for those who have been an embarrassment to the faith, a failure before God and before men, there is still hope. All is not lost. And therefore, this evening, I would like us to consider the nature of a penitent heart, a heart that is humble, a heart that realizes it has failed, but then turns to God. And as we go through this passage, and as we look at the life of David, the heart of David, I pray that it will help all of us who have failed, or who will fail, because we will all fail at one time or another, isn't it? I'm not prophesying, it's simply the truth, isn't it? You will fail. I will fail. What kind of a heart should we have? Well, first of all, I want us to see from this passage that 
a heart that is penitent, a heart that realizes its failure, should not run away from God. It should actually be a heart that seeks God in earnest prayer. And so I want us to see from this passage, God's affliction and our earnest prayer or prayer. We see in this passage that the words that come before verse 15 are very hard words. You know, Nathan tells to David, you are the man. You are the man who has done this wicked thing. You have shed innocent blood. You have taken someone else's wife. And here is the judgment of God. And he lifts the judgment of God. He says, because of this thing, the sword shall not depart from your house. And your wives shall be taken by another. And he shall lie with them in the public. And this child that you have conceived with Bathsheba, he shall die. David knew from the words spoken by Nathan that the child will surely die because God has said it. The prophecy about the child dying is now being fulfilled. We see this in verse 15. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David and he became sick. So here we have the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy by Nathan. The affliction of Yahweh is upon David. The afflicting hand of Yahweh is now upon David and his household. The child is sick. And you can imagine being David. You can imagine being David that the Lord says that this child shall die and you wake up one day and the servants tell you, you know, your child is sick. You can imagine the kind of heartbreaks it would bring. Because you know what's coming, isn't it? You know what's next. But as we see from this passage, David does not surrender himself to his predicament. He does not simply accept his fate. David doesn't say, you know what? Okay, God prophesied the child will die and therefore let me sit and cry or let me just sit and uh, wait or let me look for the best doctor in town. That's not what David does. What does David do? In verse 16, we are told, and David did what? Therefore, he sought God. Honest prayer. And he's not simply praying, asking God, God, if you can, save the child. It is honest prayer. Look at this. He fasted. He lay all night on the ground. He would not eat anything. And when people would lift him up, what would David do? He would go back to the ground. This passage demonstrates, now listen to me, this passage demonstrates that fatalism is not biblical. But David could have simply said, you know, I have sinned. I simply accept that I have sinned and this is the consequence of my sin. And let me take on the consequence of my sin. No. David engages in prayer. Dear brethren, fatalism is not biblical. Even in such a situation where you know that the afflictions you are going through are as a result of God's judgment or punishment or discipline. If I, I think discipline is the best word. Even, even where it's God's discipline upon you.
Because many times, especially we who are reformed, we would say, you know what, God is sovereign. I have sinned. And therefore, let me deal with my... Let me just swallow my judgment. Let me receive whips from heaven. You know how those there were people in school who uh, would not even plead with a teacher when they were just called to the front to be punished. They would just come and immediately just bend and be ready to receive the the whips. Well, there were those who would plead. I remember there was this young lady in our class who she would always plead, plead to the extent that she would moan. And what normally would happen is. She would not, when the rest of us were getting three strokes, she would probably only get one. Well, we need to learn from that. <clears throat> we shouldn't just say, okay, heaven has decided these are my whips. Let me just set myself and be ready to take my punishment. No. David engages in prayer. He seeks the Lord. He pleads with the Lord. He prays for the child. He, this is actually his words in verse 22. Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? God is gracious. God is so gracious that David knows I will plead with him. Even as he whips me, I will plead with him. And even as he whips me again, I will cry out to him even more. The Lord is gracious. Actually, one of, the, one of the things we show when we become fatalistic and we do not pray, we simply accept things as they are, is that we are actually saying that God is not gracious. That's actually what we are saying. What we are showing, we could be saying, you know, I believe God is gracious. We can say, you know, one of the pillars of the, the, the five solars, as we had this morning, is grace alone. But is this God of yours gracious? Is God really gracious if you can't pray to him? If you can't plead with him? Observe from David. He cries out to God. He fasts. We must not simply surrender things. We must not just simply say, well, you know what? Kenya is under God's judgment. Let's leave it as it is. Well, Nairobi is under God's judgment. Let's leave it as it is. Let judgment continue. We are being fatalistic. Why not plead, yes, and even say to the Lord, yes, Lord, we know that we are right for judgment. We know as Kenya, we know us as a country, we are right for judgment, but please, Lord, have mercy. Just because we are under the heavy hand of God's discipline, it doesn't mean that we allow ourselves or surrender ourselves to the situation. We need to pray. For those who are here and you are undergoing God's discipline in one way or another, pray to God. Seek his faith. Plead with him. This is what, for example, James tells us to show us this wonderful reality in James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And then let me just skip a little bit to show you what this person suffering is going through. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Do you see that? That actually the context here is that this is someone who is suffering or is sick because of what? Because of sin, isn't it? 
And they are told, please pray. Please pray. Pray. And even call the elders of the church to pray for you. Because as your pastors, we probably know the sin in your life. And we are coming to plead to the Lord. That yes, Lord, sin has overcome this person, but have mercy on him. And here's a guarantee that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Pray for one another. Pray for yourself. Don't simply give up on those who are overwhelmed by sin. Don't simply give up on those who, as a church, we have sadly met together and we have excommunicated. Pray for them. There is still hope. Pray for yourself. You who has been overcome by sin and you who is being tormented by sin. You who has been, your conscience is not giving you peace and you know that you are suffering because of your sin. Pray. Even in the time of affliction. But secondly, we not only see that David prays and pleads, what does a penitent heart look like? What does a heart that has been humbled by its sins look like? What does a heart of a person who would say, Lord, I am a loser, I am a failure, I have failed? They, yes, they engage in prayer. But then there is something else that is seen in their heart. Submission. So we are told in the next verses, verses 18 to 23, what happens? That as David is praying and pleading, we are told on, on the seventh day, the child died. So what David was praying against happens. And again, we might look at this and wonder, okay, pastor, why did David have to pray and the child dies? Well, let me say this, and I should have said this when I was in point number one, that prayer is a command. We are commanded to pray. We pray when things are good, when things are bad, we pray. We plead, we seek God's faith because he has commanded us to do so. But the other thing that is even a shocker to the people around David is they, they, uh, they hear of the, the, the death of the child and they come to David and they wonder, you know, should we tell David? Should we tell him? And they are arguing among themselves and they are thinking, if we tell him, he might harm himself. He is in such a bad place that he might do something to himself. And so they are worried, what, how will he receive this news? Well, we see that from this passage that David accepts or submits himself to the providence of God. That even as we pray, we pray, we plead, we seek God's face, but nonetheless, when God acts, we submit. After the long illness and the earnest prayers of David, the Lord takes the child. It is something that shocks the whole household of the king. And we see that his servants do not want to tell him about it. They wondered that such a news, how, or they wondered how such a news would be received by David and that it would probably crush him completely. But in this passage, we see David's attitude. We see what a penitent heart looks like. We see that David is a man who trusts the hand of God. 
when David receives the news, this is what he does. We are told, Then David rose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into his house and he worshipped. And he went to his own house. And when he had, and when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. David wakes, wakes up from the prayer room, he cleans himself, he eats. He submits to God's providence upon his life. Submitting to God during times of discipline is seen in how we respond or how we submit ourselves to his discipline in our lives. David doesn't become bitter. He doesn't become angry. He doesn't say, well, the child is now dead. I will continue lying on the floor. No, he rises up. One of the ways we show that we trust the hand of God is that we lift ourselves from dust. You know, sometimes uh, I would argue that the modern psychology is not helping because it tells you that while you are going through this situation, you have a right to continue lying in the dust. Oh no. David accepts what God has done. Yes, he still has the pain in his heart. He will still he even says, I shall go to him. In other words, he still longs for that child. It doesn't take away the pain. But he doesn't use his pain as an excuse to continue on with life, with the duties of life. We show our submission to God by going back to our duty. He takes care of himself. The first duty is that he takes care of his own body. He cleans himself. He eats. And it is good, by the way, that when we are going through hard times, discipline, take care of your body. Eat well. One of the reasons why uh, people don't recover, even emotionally, from a, a hard hit in life is because physically we are not well. We are not sleeping well. We are not eating well. We are not exercising. Take care of your body. Yes, you've gone through a season of God's hand being heavy upon you. And yes, it's painful. Rise up. Rise up by the strength that the Lord gives. And go on with the duties of life. But David does not only take care of his physical duties. We see that he also takes care of his spiritual duties. He washes, he anoints himself, he puts on clothes, he eats. But then what are we told? And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. David goes to the house of God. He submits himself. He doesn't run away from God. He doesn't say, now I have a reason to stay away from church. He actually now engages in worship. And not just private worship, but public worship. David goes to the house of God, which then speaks of the tabernacle, where he worships God. That's what we are told in verse 20. Worship, and especially public worship, shows a heart that submits itself to God, even though it is under pain even though it is unsettled and troubled by the discipline of God. Please don't run away from church. 
don't find times of hardship to be a time when you get to run away from church. You say, well, people will understand anyway. I failed publicly. I fell into this sin or I did not do my duty in one way or the other. Let me stay away from church. No, you're making things worse for yourself. Go and worship. And not just private worship, public worship. He goes to the tabernacle. He gathers with the rest of Israel in worshiping God. The priests are there seeing him worshiping God. The Levites are there seeing him worship God. And they probably had heard what had happened. News had probably spread. But David says, the embarrassment of my failure will not keep me from the tabernacle, will not keep me from worshipping God. This is the one thing that we must learn, to submit ourselves under the hand of God when we are under discipline. Don't run away. Don't start justifying yourself and giving yourself reasons why you cannot do your duties at home, why you cannot do your duties at work, where, why you cannot do your duty at church. Praise God. This is what the psalmist says in Psalms 42. When he goes through hard times. Psalms 42 verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. But then thirdly, so we've seen first of all that David engages in earnest prayer. He then is submitted to God when the child dies. He accepts the will of God. He accepts the work of God. He is not bitter. But then thirdly, we see that with such a heart, with, with a heart that is humble, penitent, broken before God, a heart that truly sees its sin, its failure, It focuses and rejoices and finds joy in the rich love, the rich restoring love of God. We are told in verse 24, a very short statement, but a very powerful statement. A very important statement. We are told then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her. And she bore a son and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. And the Lord loved him. The love of God is displayed, is spoken of. In a chapter or in the part of this book that is so dark, who would ever think that such a statement that God loves can come in the same context as God's sword will be upon someone's family? That God says He will bring death, where God says, that he will bring his sword. And then in the same context, we are told that God loves. A very important statement. We see here that the greatness and excellence of God's love is displayed to us. And this greatness and excellence of God's love is seen when the recipient 
or when the recipients are most undeserving. Who in this passage deserved the love of God? David didn't deserve the love of God. Even Solomon, who had just been born, didn't deserve the love of God. What had Solomon done? What had David done to deserve the love of God? Actually, we can even say David does not deserve the love of God at all. The Lord loves him. Solomon was simply a child in his mother's womb. He loves him. This takes us back again to what we learned today from Romans. I mean, what did we do for God to love us? All that we have done is to bring to him our filthy, ugly, smelly, dirty sins. That's all that we can offer to God. Fear God. And God takes that and he gives us his love. That's why God's love is amazing. And that's why Paul says to the Ephesians that his prayer is for them to understand the height, the depth, the, the oh, how great the love of God is. And maybe one of the reasons why we, you may not appreciate the love of God is you have not seen how terrible and dark your sins are. You know, Christ said, give an example of two people and he said, you know, one person was forgiven of, let's say, 10 shillings and another person was forgiven of a billion shillings. Who we love the most? One who's forgiven the most easily. And maybe the reason we need to ask ourselves, have I forgotten the love of God? We are focused and we are concerned about every other thing. We've lost sight of the love of God. It's because we've lost sight of how dirty and how smelly our sin is. God loves David, a man who despised God by killing Uriah. He sheds innocent blood and he takes the wife of this man who he has killed. God loves the child even though the child has done nothing good or bad. And that's why the writer of 2 Samuel takes us back to the battle that took place with the Ammonites to show us that the love of God had been poured out to David so much that he is restored. David is still on the throne. David is still able to do his duty of overcoming the Ammonites, the enemies of the people of God. God's love. The love of God is the reason why David is still on the throne. The love of God is the reason why David serves the people of Israel. David is restored by God's love. He is kept by God's love. And it's a wonderful thing to note that God, we are not only told that God loved, but that God sends a message about his love. You know, it's one thing for someone to love you and to keep quiet about it. Someone can Let's say a single person here, they see, maybe a young man sees a young lady and they, they love them, but they don't tell them anything. It doesn't, it doesn't help, isn't it? But when you communicate it and that person responds to it, it's wonderful. God's love is not only there, it is communicated. And, and the Lord loved him and sent a message. By Nathan the prophet. 
David hears about God's love. He gets a sermon on God's love. Again, where do the failures go? What message should they hear, those who have failed, those who are weak? Or let me say, we who have failed, we who are weak, we who are broken. One of the best messages that we can hear is God's love for us in Christ, isn't it? And that's why, for example, when, when, when the Apostle Paul writes to the churches, churches that are a mess like the Corinthians, I mean, the, the church in Corinth was such a mess. But he begins by telling them of what? God's love for you, Corinthians. God loves you. The Father loves you. Christ loves you. What we learn from this passage is that the knowledge of God's love is the key to our re restoration when we fall. And this love of God is revealed in God's love, uh, God's word to us. As we read the word, we experience God's love for us in Christ. And this takes us again to that greater son of David by whom God sees that he is well pleased. Jesus Christ, by whom then we are loved. This is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. To eight. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now listen to this wonderful message of love. Just like David is, is loved in the context of him being a failure, him being in the weakest position that he can be, listen to God's love for us in Christ. For while we were still weak, or while we were still sinners, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. In that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the unbeliever who is seated here, who is watching me by the, the live stream, and you and, and you've listened to the sermon and you're saying, I'm a failure. I have fallen into sin. I continue falling into sin. I am a mess. I am an embarrassment to my family. I am an embarrassment. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes may not perish but have everlasting life. That's the message. Not now being brought by Nathan, the prophet, but now being brought to us by God himself from John 3.16. God's love in Christ is the cure to your problem. God's love in Christ is the cure to your sin, to your failure. Repent of your sins and come to this God. Plead with him to forgive you. And in Christ, 
He will forgive your sin. He will restore you. For the believer who is seated and listening to me, and you look at yourself and you say, well, I have failed, Pastor. I have not been diligent in this area of my Christian life. I have not been diligent in this or that. I have actually even failed. Here's the remedy to your situation. Focus on the love of God in Christ. Focus on this God who richly pours out his love upon us in Christ. Where our failures in Christ are cleansed away. Where our sins in Christ are washed away. Yes, everyone around you may remember your great failure. They may even talk about it behind your back. They may even not treat you as you expect because of your failure. But remember the God in heaven, in Christ, loves you. He has cast your sin into the sea. Where it will not be remembered against you. Have, have hope, dear brethren. Find restoration. Find joy. Even as you are under God's discipline, even as you endure suffering, remember God's love for us in Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your love for us in Christ. We thank you that when we were still fallen, you loved us. And even right now, just like with David, who could only offer up sin, and you gave him your rich love, you restored him. You continued to use him. You gave him victory over the Ammonites. Because of that love, we pray that, O oh Lord, you would help us focus on your love. To remember how vile and how ugly our sins are. And may that draw us closer to the cross of Christ, where love in all its glory is shown. O oh Lord, grant us this. And we pray that we would, we would be a church that prays for one another, that for those who have failed, that, O oh Lord, we would pray for each other and we would pray for ourselves. We would not be fatalistic. We would not just sit back. But we would engage in prayer. Praying for ourselves. And praying and pleading for your mercies upon us. We ask you that you would also help us to be those who are submitted to you. Knowing that you are the God who is in the heavens and you do whatever you please. And even as we submit to you, that we would continue on with our physical duties and our spiritual duties. That our failures will not keep us away from doing our duty because we are still called to do our duty. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us especially that we may give ourselves to the duty of worship. That our failures, our sins, our shameful and even embarrassing sins may not keep us from coming together with your people and singing to the God of heaven. So oh, help us, O oh Lord. So be with us, O oh Lord. And help us to meditate on the truth, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.